Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. It's your host, Matt Zahab. We are buzzing as always. Still in Mexico, episode 301. What a treat. And I'm super pumped to have today's guest on the show, who also has the best name in the world and who is also rocking the off yellow shirt, the off yellow tarp. However, his looks like a beautiful traditional finance tarp like a big old banker. And then there's me looking like a peasant with the Uniqlo off yellow shirt. No free ads, but these Uniqlo shirts are pretty comfy. Time for the intro. Today we have Matthew Graham, the managing partner of Rise Labs and one of the key drivers of the long-term strategic vision and mission of the firm. Matthew founded Rise back in 2015. Wow, what a rip. Initially as a sell side tech investment banking platform with a focus on representing international tech companies for strategic partnership and investment in emerging markets. Matthew has been involved in the blockchain industry since 2013, a true chiseled veteran and has supported many great entrepreneurs and companies through good and bad times. Super pumped to have you on. Matthew, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? Great to be here. This will be a lot of fun. Thanks for that great intro. We've got the same name. We're dressed the same. I think we're ready to go. We planned it. Yeah, if you guys are watching this and not listening, you guys are in for a treat. This is going to be a good one. Let's jump right into it. Talk of the talk, the creme de la creme right now. Everyone's talking about the Bitcoin ETF. This is going to air on Thursday, January 18th, folks. We are recording one day earlier, so this episode is going to be hot and fresh. Bitcoin ETF, it popped off. Everyone thought it was going to rip. I was glued to CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap. I was glued to Twitter for those first couple of days, checking all the inflows. I know we did break all the records for most inflows and highest volume for any ETF over the first couple of days. We love to see that, but we don't love to see the price action. What happened there? Was this part of this whole GBTC where everyone was selling off in order to move into the ETF? Matthew, give us the laydown, give us the lowdown. What happened with the first week of trading with the Bitcoin ETF? Sure, it did end up being a sell the news situation for sure. We actually view these ETF inflows and outflows as quite important. So we're actually currently internally doing a real deep dive on on this issue. But uh, currently my view is that selling from GPTC was probably a significant factor. Beyond that, it, it may be a little hard to say. But I think the short-term price action is mostly a sideshow from what I think is really substantially more important. And here's what I think is more important. The Bitcoin ETF has been an enormous success. In fact, the aggregate trading volume of the new Bitcoin ETFs are substantially higher than the trading volume of all approximately 500 ETFs that were launched in 2023, all of them put together. So let me just repeat that because it's so important. You combine everything launched in 2023, all the United States ETFs, combine them all. The trading volume uh, of all those combined, you compare it to the new Bitcoin ETFs, the Bitcoin ETFs are higher in trading volume than everything done in 2023. So I repeated it because I think that's that's really quite extraordinary. This is uh, a blockbuster success for the Bitcoin ETF in terms of people demonstrating that they absolutely want this product. So what that means is very quickly, Wall Street is going to become addicted to this asset class. This is only the first domino to fall. I I think that's bullish for the prospect of an Ethereum ETF in terms of these powerful Wall Street interests that will be even more determined to make this happen. Uh, I think it's extremely positive for uh, Wall Street in general getting more involved in this industry. I think that is the most important takeaway for me from the Bitcoin ETF rather than uh, short-term price action may be influenced by GPTC outflows. Honestly, who cares? I think that that's small potatoes compared to this much more important thing, which is that uh, huge success for Wall Street. They're going to be they're going to want to do this more and more in all different ways, participate in our in our industry. Yeah, well said there. Speaking of the ETF, I had a buddy. Um, yes, it was actually yesterday, and he was he was at Atlanta Airport, and obviously that's one of the biggest and most popular airports in the world. 
he had to go to two different terminals because his flight got canceled. Long story short, in both terminals, he saw an advertisement for two different ETFs. I believe it was the Valkyrie one was one of them. And the other one, it may have even been, I think it might've been the BlackRock, but these, these guys, it's a weekend and they already have ads in airport terminals. Like this is bananas. What can we see from an actual pushing the ETF perspective? Like, are these guys going to go balls to the walls with advertisements and calling all the brokers and trying to get this in everyone's hands as quick as possible? Matt, this is such a great point. So I'm, I'm really glad you, you brought this up. We've actually been having a lot of conversations with people around just this issue in recent weeks. So an ETF is fundamentally a commodity product, by which I mean that there is not a huge differentiator from any one Bitcoin ETF compared to any one of the others. Mechanics may differ around the margins, at least for this class of Bitcoin ETFs. There are some nuances around if it's cash to cash or, or actually there's some nuances on the mechanics. But you can, you can think of at least this class of Bitcoin ETFs as, uh, as substantially all the same. So what that means is that from the provider perspective, there is a substantial risk of a war on fees and that these fees will ultimately be driven to zero, which means not literally zero, but you know, 0.2%, let's say, 0.1% even. Effectively, here's what that means. The Bitcoin ETF providers are trying to establish beachheads through marketing, thinking that at least some of the inflows will be sticky and they can decrease the probability of competing only on price. So as Matt, as you identified already through the example of your friend who, God help him, is in Atlanta, I think. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, pulling out for that guy. But, but at any rate, through the example of your friend, we are already seeing that there is absolutely going to be balls to the walls marketing on these ETFs. And that is enormously powerful for our industry. It's enormously powerful in showing people that our industry, I mean, we all know this, but people outside our industry still may have question marks that our industry is here to stay, that it's going to be a powerful asset class. I know that's hard to imagine because we're at 1.x trillion dollars as an asset class, 1.6 or whatever it is today. Hard to imagine, but for people outside our industry, they may still have question marks. And this is going to be very powerful for demonstrating our legitimacy, the fact that this is an institutional ready asset class. And it's going to start causing people to really think about not if they take this industry seriously or if they should buy some Bitcoin, but rather asking questions like, what percentage of my portfolio should be crypto? Questions like that. So I, I really think it's enormously important, uh, the marketing spent. So as, as a consumer, and I know we are buzzing on the Bitcoin ETF, it's just such yeah. a you know, powerful and present day topic. We'll move, we'll move on. But last, last question here. As a consumer or as a market manager, how do you choose what ETF to put your clients in? Is it strictly just like you said, the battle of advertising and marketing? Is it you know, the one who has the lowest fee for the first little bit? Is it the one who's doing the social good and giving 10% back to the Bitcoin miners? Like, How do you choose which one to get into if it's really all the same product at the end of the day? Sure. So I'm, I'm not really in the business of advising on Bitcoin ETFs, but if a buddy said to me, hey, you know, quick question, which ETF should I, should I do? I would say just sort them by fees. Go with the one with the right. lowest fee is, is probably your best bet. I would probably double check to make absolutely sure that that would be my final recommendation. But yeah, ultimately, these are commodity products. And um, the providers of these products do not want people to think like that. They want instead people to think emotionally, which is why they're running expensive ad campaigns. Yeah, well said there. Let's jump into some, we can also get into some of you and your team's investments. And you guys have done an incredible job, by the way, and I can't wait to get into that. But let's talk about some of the 2024 trends as we're still hot and fresh, nice and early in the year. We've seen Solana absolutely rip its pants off and go for just an absolute ripper magoo. It's made a lot of people a lot of money, especially all those 
folks who sort of bought at the top last year. And if they did hold all the way down to the $9 mark and wrote it back up, good for them. We're seeing DPIN, which is a massive trend right now. Account abstraction in Ethereum. We're seeing a lot of decentralized finance trends. A whole lot of everything. What are you most excited for? Liquid staking, I also have to mention. Are there any trends in particular, Matthew, that are really tickling you and your team's fancy right now that you guys have all eyes on? Sure. So we're looking at a number of different narratives, uh, as we always do. Uh, maybe I'll just pick one that I spent most of my time on today. <laughs> uh, today, um, we've been looking carefully at the probability of an Ethereum ETF, analyzing that very carefully. Will it be considered a commodity or a security? Maybe because of the futures product precedent that is past. Maybe because of that, there's precedent that it could be treated as a commodity. So we've been spending a lot of time looking at Ethereum ETF, it's, if it's going to happen or not. The first time that it could get approved is in May. Of course, it would not launch in May. But that could be substantially bullish for Ethereum. And additionally, the new Cancun uh, upgrade and some of the new EIPs we think could be quite conducive as well to reducing congestion mm -hmm. effectively and lowering the cost of transactions on Ethereum. On a related note, we're also carefully looking at RWAs. And we do think that there's a substantial probability that Ethereum will be a natural home for RWAs. So we've been spending a lot of time on Ethereum in recent days. And in fact, with myself specifically, I spent a lot of my time on Ethereum today. ETH hasn't gone up in price as much as everyone would have liked to over the last little bit. Is there a specific reason for this? I know you guys are obviously super tied into everything in this regard. And just as a quick little follow-up to this question, how could the ETH ETF, are we going to see similar, you know, buy the narrative, sell the news kind of thing, buy the ETF, sell the news? Like what's going to go on with the ETH ETF if it does happen in May, like a lot of people think it will? I think that there is also a Grayscale ETH product. So there yep. could be selling pressure uh, as a result of that. I'd have to look at the details, but that's certainly a, uh, a possibility. And I think that could be by the narrative and ultimately sell the official the official event. That's that's a possibility, but I think there's always high error bars around it. Your first question, or the first part of your question, was around Ethereum and perhaps why it's underperformed a little bit in recent months. Yeah. Yeah. So I gave some reasons why Ethereum possibly might have a more bullish 2024. There's also another factor to that, which I think explains why it's been underperforming recently. So as I was explaining it the other day, if you have, for example, uh, Bitcoin, which has a, a, a substantially smaller feature set, it's yeah. robust. It's well understood. It has a compelling narrative around it. It can do a few things very, very well, such as capture people that are interested in digital gold. On the other end of the spectrum, you have something like Solana, which has an enormously rich feature set. It can do many, many things quite well. If you're on those two opposite ends of the spectrum, I think those are two really interesting places to be. If you split the middle of those two things, I think that's tough. Good point. You're going to have a lot of people who are saying, well, Bitcoin's probably better for that than Ethereum. And a lot of people who are going to say, well, Solana is really more suitable than Ethereum for this. So I, I think that that creates a lot of difficulties. Uh, but with that said, for example, RWAs, may have a natural home on Ethereum. We'll have to see, but uh, to the extent that narrative does take off, to the extent these uh, Cancun and these new EIPs prove to be catalysts, there, there could be a more compelling 2024. But I think that there's still this fundamental challenge of competitive positioning. Yeah, there's so many different narratives about ETH right now. And your team sent over an incredible little cheat sheet to help prep mm -hmm. for this podcast. And one thing that I was completely unaware of, Matthew, is that Celsius has approximately 300 million cited in ETH as a primary factor, planning to unstake its ETH holdings. I believe it actually started a couple of weeks ago on January 4th and distribute these to creditors in Ethereum or convert them to USDC. Um, there is also a give or take 10-day elongated ETH withdrawal queue. Like, I still can't believe that Celsius has 
this much of a pull on the market. Like, you know what I mean? Because it, it happened what, two years yeah. ago with 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 FTX and Celsius. It's sort of you don't even want it to be front of mind because it's it, it had such a negative impact. But these things are they're still fucking our day up. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it. years yeah. later. What what's going on with the whole Celsius and FTX? Sorry, go ahead. It's like all those words you muted on Twitter, right? You can't take any more. Take it anymore. I'm gonna just mute Celsius. Exactly. Uh, mute the word Celsius. But yeah, unfortunately, there's still to some extent an overhang for our industry, but especially you know for specific products and in specific ways. There, we we do still have aftershocks even today from you know some of the tumult that we had earlier. I. Truly, really look forward to never hearing some of these names again. But unfortunately, they do impact us still. It's it's truly, truly wild. Yeah, I'd love to jump to some VC views here, it's just sort of strictly from a VC perspective. Obviously, you are currently in Asia. I'd love if you could talk about some of the difference in regards to the regulatory environment in Asia versus Western markets, and if you could tie that into sort of you know the light of the BTC ETF approval, that'd be great as well. So. I think the the first thing to to that it strikes me as really quite important is I don't think you can discuss it in terms of an Asia regulatory framework, for example. Uh, it's very tempting to do that. I, I fully get that, but it it really varies considerably from country to country, and in fact, it even varies considerably from mainland China to Hong Kong. So I, I really think you kind of have to go jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Mainland China, for example, is not necessarily super friendly to crypto. There are a lot of misconceptions. People think that Bitcoin is banned in mainland China, which is not true. But still, it's not super friendly at all. Whereas Hong Kong is, is really quite permissive by comparison. So if, you have to, if, if it really makes sense to even differentiate between mainland China and Hong Kong, it definitely makes sense to differentiate between you know, Vietnam and Singapore and Thailand and India and all these, all these places throughout Asia. So that's the first thing that I would really emphasize. I think there are uh, a lot of dangers to treating it as a monolithic block. Very interesting there. <laughs> that's, it's... Again, for someone like me who, I mean, the only part of Asia I've been to is India. I've unfortunately never been to China or Hong Kong uh, or, or Eastern Asia. It's on the to-do list. I will get there. You hear, and we've had so many really incredible VCs similar to yourself on the show who do reside in Asia and work a lot of magic in Asia. And we don't get to see or use any of these incredible products that are in Asia as well that I feel like does have a lot of emphasis on how you would choose to invest, even like the WeChat, right? These super products that us over here in North America, like, you know, we have our iPhone, we have WhatsApp. I mean, heck, unless if you're in Canada and USA, you don't even use WhatsApp, you use iMessage. And then you have these mega company conglomerates in Asia and China, like the WeChats, where you have your bank, you have your messaging, you have your commerce, you have absolutely everything. It's pretty freaking cool to see. Are there any crypto specific companies, Matthew, at the moment that are really making moves in Asia? Because it's such a massive frigging market. Are there any on your radar that are really getting you guys going? Let me answer in this way. So one of the, the most important things actually for my business is the fact that the information asymmetry between East and West, West and East, in our industry is absolutely enormous. It's staggering. It's crazy. For a recent example is with ordinals. Ordinals took off far faster and is still far more popular in Asia, uh, especially in China, frankly, versus the West. So as a result of having access to boots on the ground and, and information, both West and East, we were able to be one of the first investors anywhere in the West to actually invest in, in ordinals and related technologies. It is absolutely fascinating, far more than TradFi by a factor of 10, if not 100, how little the relationship circles overlap, how it's little crazy. information is transmitted both ways, East and West, West and East. It absolutely blows my mind whenever I think about it. There is just hugely different, just, there's just absolutely enormous differences in consumer preferences, in narratives, in popular coins, and things like that. For example, 
If I were to name the most popular meme coin in recent weeks, or one of them in China, I, I think with high confidence you haven't heard of it. Rats, like the animal, one of the most popular meme coins in Asia, especially China <laughs> recently. Of course you haven't heard Big of it, no. right? And, and so there's just this enormous gaps. Now, obviously, please, that, that's a shit coin. That's like... Yeah, yeah. Not not financial advice. <laughs> Absolutely not. It's a, not even like it's a shitty meme coin. Okay. So I just want to be really clear. <laughs> like there's shit coins and meme coins and maybe there's some overlap. This is a shitty meme coin. All right. It's garbage. I just want to be clear. But at any rate, it has been enormously popular and there's no visibility all, at all of that internationally. So again, similarly, ordinals massively earlier in Asia, massively more popular to, to this day. There are many narratives like that. Solana is much more popular in the West. Polygon is yeah. much more popular in India. There are a lot of uh, geographic and, and community differences in our industry to an extent that uh, really is quite staggering to me to this day. It's it's so cool well, and very well explained there. I've seen so many crazy rep because people, you know, because it's just like in, in Asia, it's one thing... Same as in the West, so there are funny videos and all kinds of weird jokes. I've seen so many rats videos. I never want to see another one. Please do not send me rats videos. <laughs> yes, yes. Folks, not investment advice. He has just given us a good story to fortify the point of East versus exactly. West narratives. But <laughs> huge, huge, huge shout out to our sponsor of the show, Prime XBT. Prime XBT offers a robust trading system for both beginners and professional traders. It doesn't matter if you're a rookie or a vet, you can easily design and customize your layouts and widgets to best fit your trading style. Prime XBT is also running an exclusive promotion for listeners of the Crypto News podcast. Use the promo code CryptoNews50, that is CryptoNews50, to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. Again, that is CryptoNews50 to receive 50% of your deposit credited to your trading account. And now back to the show with Matthew. Let's jump into a couple more VC questions and VC points here. I think being a VC is an incredible job. I know it's sort of been glorified over the last 10 years, especially with someone like me who spends far too much time on Twitter. I follow a shit ton of VCs. It seems like a really cool job. Obviously, you got to work your ass off. You got to work your tail off. And it's all about getting that little itty bit of alpha to hit a home run. It's a volume-based game. Anytime I have a VC on the show, I always need to ask, how do you and your team go about your investment strategy? Are there any queries or nuances that you really dig down on, that you really look into, right? Besides the obvious, like, what is the overall market like? What's the TAM? What's the moat? How good is the team? Is this the first time founder? Blah, blah, blah. Are there any sort of weird ones or weird pointers, nuances that you could discuss about how you and the team go about your investment strategy? I think ultimately, as a VC, especially in earlier stages, ultimately you are betting on people. And I think that especially in crypto, you want to have someone that you are confident will plug away. A lot of people work on projects for three months and then they, 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 they say, oh, I didn't immediately get traction. Now I'm going to work on something else. Or they'll, um, they'll have a huge success with their first product and then they'll say, well, instead of continuing to develop that, we will develop adjacent products, but we'll, we'll do that under new tokens, which you know is not great for your investors. So I think one of the most important things, especially in earlier stages, is to probe and evaluate the extent to which you think that someone is likely to keep grinding away for long periods of time, basically. And that's that's number one, of course. Give me some weird ones here, Matthew. Any super weird ones where like, you know, a team came in with a new narrative or or is there something about a pitch deck perhaps or the way someone dresses or anything? Is there any any sort of weird hunches? And follow up to that is the importance of trusting your gut. Was there ever one where where your gut was just like, Matthew, I I you need to do this. I have to do this. I look for a lot of trust related signals. Um is probably one that is a good answer to your question. So I carefully observe how people treat, you know, their wife or girlfriend, their kids. If they if they have pets, I'm more likely to trust them, to be honest. I, I look for a lot of trust-related signals. I love that. 
I'm, I'm less likely to trust someone if they don't like animals than kids, honestly. 100%. I love that. What about what, what about some of your biggest winners and losers that you can talk about? Did you and the team pass up any behemoths that just still sort of eat you away? And I hate to ask the negative s question, but the people are going to love it. Any big winners and big losers that you can discuss on the show here, Matthew? Sure. So of course, uh, it's well well known that we were very early investors in Solana. Although we we accumulated most of our position in the in the secondary market, we, we were extremely early. Out of our institutional fund, we're thrilled about our performance with Layer Zero, where we came in at seed. Yeah, those are uh, two examples that we are well known for. Uh, in terms of the ones that got away, uh, <laughs> okay, I'll give you an example. At this point in time, I was not yet investing my own money. I was not doing angel checks at this time, and I, I should have made an exception because I remember getting a deck in 2015, I guess it was. And I said to my team that this is the best deck I've ever seen in my life. This is the most compelling thing I've ever seen. And I, I should have said to myself, well, you're not doing angel checks. Maybe you, you should do it your first angel check. But I didn't think that way. I just thought, huh, this is absolutely fucking amazing. And I, I just <laughs> didn't think that. Any, any guesses as to what that was? E-T-H? No, but I mean, the, the, the right, the timing is right. It wasn't ETH. What was it? Pitmax. Best deck I've ever oh, seen. Oh, no. Yeah. What made the deck so good? It was absolutely crystal clear that this was the right team, an opportunity that super fucking made sense. It was just enormously compelling in, in terms of them demonstrating clarity of vision, that they had the people to accomplish the vision, demonstrating that they already had, even in the earliest uh, iterations, something that people want wanted. It was uh, like jaw-dropping good. I mean, it was really astonishingly compelling. I'm, I'm just taking notes here on the secret sauce of, of making a pitch deck here. So BitMEX came across, and obviously they are bloody huge. Yeah. What can you and the team learn from something like this? Well, I think what I should have learned is that you should be willing to bend your own rules if something's that fucking good, you know? <laughs> if, if something that appealing comes across the table, yeah, the rules so should be broken. If you're not doing angel checks and you, it's the best fucking thing you've ever seen, maybe maybe, maybe you should do an angel check. If, even if maybe write a one, check. Right? I, I was just going to ask you about your gut, just because this is a subject that I'm extremely yeah. passionate about. And uh, I journal myself and I look back at times when I made good or bad decisions yeah. and either did or didn't trust my gut. What was your gut saying at the time? It was, are you just reiterating the points that you said over the last two minutes where just everything screamed, this is going to be a home run, this is absolutely freaking incredible? Yeah, I just thought it was absolutely going to be a home run. Just like, this guy is going to fucking kill it. Yeah. Which actually I was off by a year or two because he struggled. Arthur struggled for the first year or two. In fact, he, right. um, he struggled to get funding. Even when he got some funding, he struggled to get substantial traction uh, to the point where they entered in an accelerator in mainland China. In Shanghai, I think it was. It's called um, China Accelerator. It's owned by SOSV. So they had gotten funding they were not getting traction. They gave away equity to an accelerator with how badly they were struggling. So actually, it, it took them a good year or two of grinding. So I was wrong that in, the, in, in the sense that I thought it was going to be an immediate fucking home run. <laughs> no. I was wrong about that. Thanks. But, uh, a couple of years. But actually, the breakthrough moment for them is when they implemented 100x Leverage was yeah. actually when they just went hockey stick. Yeah, to the moon. Yeah. Very cool, <laughs> Matthew. You've been uh, you've been absolutely on fire here. We are getting a little tight for time. Couple more questions. I want to go back to 2024 investment narrative, investment trends. I named off a couple. Is there any in particular that you and the team are super keen on right now? 2024 investment trends and investment narratives. Sure, there's a lot we're keen on, but to give another example. We are having the most innovation in the Bitcoin ecosystem that we've had in quite some time. So that's really very fascinating to us. Uh, and we're spending a lot of time looking at that. 
already made some investments uh, around that space. They're, they aren't public yet, but we're we're very excited about them. Any anything else like deep in or liquid staking? Are, are these narratives too far out for you guys to dabble, or or are these actually the, the true thing? We are actively looking at both those sectors. I, I can't expand on that at that time, but we are actively gotcha. looking at both those sectors. You could probably assume my meaning is, you know, more than that. Yeah. <laughs> but um hundred yeah, percent. And then with DPEN specifically though, I do still hold the view that with the possible exception of helium, I think in the uh the bull case for DPEN, in the bull case, three years from now, if you look at a top ten DPEN list, I think it will be very different than it is today, with the possible exception of helium. But uh, I, I do think that's a, a very compelling sector for sure. Interesting. Last question. Give me a hot take. Something super friggin' spicy. Szechuan spicy, I'm talking. Blow your socks off. Spicy. Matthew, give me one hot take before we let you go today. Harry Gensler, Gensler will, be, will be gone at this time next year. He's, he's out of here? This time next year. Why is that? Um, there have been a lot of rumors swirling that he might have, you know, one foot out the door anyway, uh, for some time, even, even, uh, rumors of he was thinking of making a congressional run, a lot of different stuff, but you know, it, it's not a high confidence hot take. He went, he went a hot take. It was the first one that, uh, that came to mind. So <laughs> I love it. I, I, I mean, it's if not he a goes, high confidence I'll... hot take. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put much, maybe it's just a wish to be honest. <laughs> Okay, me too. I would love that. I would uh, I would absolutely love that. Matthew, you were an absolute treat today. Learned a ton and had a lot of fun. Can't wait for round two. Before we let you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you personally and Rise Labs online and on socials? Sure. So I am uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm notoriously addicted to Twitter and I can be found at Matty Rise on Twitter. <laughs> M-A-T-T-Y-R-Y-Z-E. And uh, Rise Labs, riselabs.io, and we are on Twitter as well. So love it. And last question, I didn't even ask. What what about the name Rise? Where, where did that come from? Sure. So um, we rebranded because our initial name reflected our China specialty, but we've long since had uh, grown to having an emerging market specialty. So we wanted a name that could fit with our growth trajectory. And that had some good connotations around it. We have boots on the ground everywhere from uh, from Latin America to India, China, Singapore, and a lot of different places in between. So we wanted a name that could kind of keep up with us. I love it. It's clean uh, and it's got a Z in it. Big fan of those. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much. You, Absolute uh, pleasure having you on and can't wait for round two. All right. Thank you. Folks, what an episode with Matthew Grimm, managing partner of Rise Labs. He absolutely brought the heat today. Everything 2024 crypto investing related. We talk narratives, we talk trends, we talk BTC ETF, the ETH ETF, the nuances and differences between investing in the East and West. We covered it all. Huge shout out to Matthew and his team for making this happen, to my team. Thank you as always, guys. Much appreciated. Eustace. You are the man, you are the best editor in the whole wide world. Thank you for your incredible work as always. And to the listeners, thank you guys. If you enjoyed this one, please do subscribe. It would mean the world to my team and I. And as always, love you guys so much. Thank you for everything. Keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.